Hello, everyone, and welcome into the USL show. Small panel tonight, just Ryan and I, but thank you for anyone who's joining live and, of course, anyone who is listening to the podcast version. Ryan, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay, John. How are you doing tonight? Yeah, no complaints. Um, we got a lot to hit today, so excited to kind of get down to all that discussion. I did just want to start out with something a little bit more somber, and that was the news this week of Tim Hankinson passing away from cancer. He's someone who was a real servant to the game across multiple stops in the lower leagues. Uh, he's someone who, in a personal sense, I really associate with his stint with Indy 11. It was really when I was falling in love with that team, falling in love with the sport. And he and the team that he brought together was so crucial to that fandom. I think what he did across various stops, he's been known as such an amazing human being alongside everything he did. Uh, on the pitch and with these organizations just wanted to note that right from the top to start out here yeah and having a uh, coach with charleston and chattanooga and both of those clubs kind of first uh seasons he's really helped lay the groundwork for what both of those teams are today yeah definitely i mean in recent years i know he was doing a lot of the coverage uh play-by-play -play, color commentary sort of thing with san antonio really his uh, fingerprints are all over lower league soccer across the country. So I think it's proper just to kind of recognize the impact he had on the game. But uh, moving on to the, to some of the news of the week, I think something that caught my eye was the fact that OKC Energy were renewing their lease at Taft Stadium in Oklahoma City. They had gone on that year long hiatus. People had been worried just because of some of the squabbles with the ownership in the past that maybe this team wouldn't actually come back. Maybe they would drop down to League One. But I think it's really positive news that they're really on the warpath to get back into the mix pretty immediately. Yeah, that's always one of the concerns when a team goes on the quote-unquote hiatus that it just is basically delaying an inevitable uh, folding or relocation of the team. Uh, like in history, the Hammerheads had gone on a brief hiatus that eventually came back. But with uh, signing the new lease at Taft Stadium and making it a multi-year commitment, especially if you're laying a new field turf and bringing in new LED lights for the stadium, it really kind of just shows uh, that they want to make this work and have it go another time. And and obviously, uh, the past few years have really thrown off a lot of the economics for a lot of the lower league clubs. And being able to kind of like take a season back and then like refine your footing is going to be very helpful. And especially if you look across the state and what Tulsa is doing to help really build up that team, it really helps kind of just raise, uh, just kind of like raise the bar across um, the state of Oklahoma for improving their teams. Yeah, it really, I mean, strikes me reminiscent of what FC Tulsa did in a little bit of a different manner, certainly, but you had the rebrand, you now are having sort of that rebuild on the pitch, bringing in Sam Dorr and all of that. Um, I think the questions with OKC were valid just in the way that they went about the announcement. But I know just having had um, a couple of discussions with Lee Vaidman, their head coach, over the past year or so, this is a team that is committed to competing at the championship level. We saw it in their last season in the USL championship where they were willing to make a coaching change. They switched up what they were doing tactically. They didn't make the playoffs, but they were within a shouting distance of it because they showed that viability. They really cared about what was happening. And so if you're skeptical, that's fair. But at the end of the day, I do think that this is an organization that's willing to put a competitive team on the pitch. And that's a positive side or a sign rather when you can put it up against Tulsa and really get a rivalry going. You're building up that sort of central time zone, Texas, Oklahoma core that's really crucial to this league's growth and stability. So I think it's nothing but good signs for OKC at this point. And especially considering that we'll be having the uh, few MLS two sides exiting the league and to replace them with an independent club and not just that, an independent team who's had a history within USL, who's had uh, seasons of success within the playoffs. I always remember there, uh, I think it was a penalty shootout they had at home in the playoffs, I believe against Colorado Springs switchbacks where they yeah. won and then they had the fans invade the pitch right behind the goal. It was just really spontaneous. And one of the best moments of that playoff season and to have the energy coming back is a uh, very good news and good move for the league. There was a game that they had in the open cup against Rio OKC when that was a simmering rivalry. 
and I mean, the energy of the whole soccer team <laughs> Oklahoma City was alive and well. It was really something to see. I think they ended up winning that game too, if I recall correctly. I um, believe so. And then the uh, yeah. Rio turf ended up in Oakland. <laughs> Which is the best ongoing saga <laughs> of really anything in American soccer. <laughs> I want to have a piece um, of that turf end up in the Soccer Hall of Fame, or at least a piece to own if I can. Right. Oh, man, that would be a dream. I mean, you see, like, when they tear down a stadium, you'll be able to buy, like, a a part of a seat or something. I would love if I could get a piece of that Rio turf. I mean, Oakland, I think, is on their path to building their own stadium. The turf has to yeah. go somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Well, it could end up in Harlem as that um, city, or rather sub-region of New York City, was announced as getting a League One team coming in future years. Um, there's a partnership with the FC Harlem organization which had basically run a program for sort of underprivileged youth in the Harlem neighborhood. I believe they talked about uh, reaching out to maybe 10,000 people over the years, but they're going to be competing in the USL Academy Cup and eventually working towards that professional organization in the third tier. Just as someone who lives in New York City and who has seen what's happened with Queensboro recently where uh, there really hasn't been any news, and the idea of making it out to Queens is daunting. I personally could just take one train line straight up, get to a Harlem game in about half an hour. That sounds like a dream to me. And for this league to be able to partner with such a community-first, youth-centric development, a positive club, I think is a really positive development for League One that is trying to expand beyond that sort of southeastern core. Yeah, especially if you're looking into just kind of the footprint of the league and like the championship has basically now Hartford is kind of on their own island out here once you uh, lose the baby bulls out of the league. But to get uh, another team kind of in the USL ecosystem up here in um, New York is really great. And to have that team start by 2026, right before the World Cup really comes into the country, I mean, that's going to be really impressive. As uh, just, I know Queensboro has been going through their trials and tribulations for just kind of a stadium situation. What would you say would be kind of like just Harlem set up for like a stadium if they had to start, like say they were starting next season? Yeah, I mean, if they were to come in that immediately, they would probably have to find some sort of high school kind of thing, play at a really basic kind of park setup almost, and just build the most modular basic kind of uh, seating that you could think of. New York City, the challenge, of course, as we've seen with New York City FC, is getting past the zoning regulations, finding a plot of land. I think that Harlem comes in with the benefit of having run programs for youth soccer over the years, having that ground level grassroots familiarity with what they need to be doing politically, what they need to be doing organizationally. So it's still a tall task, but I think that's the wisdom of a 2026 start for the professional side of things where you've got a bit of a breeding in period to really get things nailed down in a way that is gonna support a sustainable club in the future. Yeah, and that's just something that's always really cool with uh, New York, that it just seems like they could support so many more teams than just the two uh, MLS sides and if the Cosmos ever choose to come back. But, uh, like, you look at London, who has 14 teams in the top four leagues just within that one metropolitan area, and uh, basically now with USL have Queensboro and Harlem within the their own USL family and to have of the potential to have so many more markets in and around the New York City metro area is just tremendous growth for the league and just more exposure for USL. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, the Baby Bulls, let's be real, don't count as a team that builds up any sort of support or recognition in the New York City market. So to have those four A's into real representation in what is the biggest market in the United States is nothing but a positive. I know the league is starting sort of a satellite headquarters here that's going to be focused on a lot of those media sorts of opportunities. So I think the club infrastructure to go along with that really partners well for the broader strategy of growing the USL. 
And then beyond that, just to get back to something a little bit more uh, relative to the pitch and the play there, we've got Hurricane Ian coming in to uh, sort of the southeast part of the country. And in an immediate sense in the USL, that means that the Tampa Bay Rowdies game, where they'd be hosting El Paso Locomotive, is getting pushed to October 12th. That's the Wednesday before the final match day. Uh, that's Saturday the 15th. But it's really going to create a lot of uh, tight fixtures for El Paso, a team that, despite being in sixth in the West, is still really on the playoff bubble. And it's a challenge for Tampa Bay as well, a team that isn't quite that solid in terms of their uh, first round home playoff game. So I think it was absolutely necessary to move the game because of the hurricane, but it does create a lot of questions for the teams involved. Any thoughts on the hurricane? How are you responding as someone in the Southeast? Yeah, so obviously our uh, just kind of thoughts and uh, just everything is just going out to the people of Tampa that we hope you're staying safe and just doing everything you can to uh, just stay safe and be uh, protecting yourselves and your loved ones during these next couple of days with uh, Hurricane Ian that we are still thinking of you here at the USL show. But yeah, it was a necessary move. And you're seeing this outside of um, just outside of USL there. Uh, ECU actually had a college football game scheduled to play in Tampa on Saturday that they had moved out as well. But yeah, the Rowdies now get the uh, three consecutive home games to end the year, which was really interesting just to have Loud and El Paso and the Baby Bulls to kind of close out their season. And like you had mentioned, that their kind of hold on a first round playoff game is not as uh, it's not as locked in as you would think, especially as you have Birmingham level on points with them, Pittsburgh uh, two points behind and Detroit four points behind that. I think they really need to go into these final three games and they have Monterey this Saturday. Hey, but they really need to really kind of go into these final three home games with nine points out of them. Yeah, and just kind of going to the El Paso perspective there, they actually have that final Saturday off, so they can really go all out in that Wednesday game against Tampa Bay, which is a bit of a boon for them. Uh, right now, they're one point up on our GV for that last playoff spot, but Monterey is breathing down their necks with a game in hand. Oakland is just three points back on an even amount of matches played. You look at this El Paso team and you think, based on the talent they have, the track record over the past couple of years, that they really should be a comfortable playoff side. But that's just not the reality right now. And they're going to be, uh, given that they had a bye last week, given that they have a bye now for this week, it's really going to be interesting how they respond having had so much time off, have they lost a little bit of the flow and the connectivity that they've shown recently? So it throws a wrench in what's already a very hectic race down the stretch. Yeah, and considering that the uh, two of the three remaining teams they have left on their schedule is the aforementioned Tampa Bay, but Colorado Springs and, uh, El and Orange County, it makes it very difficult to uh, just kind of go up in, against some of these teams concerning both of them, uh, or at least, or sorry, two of these three have been playoff sides for pretty much the entire season. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, you mentioned Colorado Springs briefly there, and something interesting recently has been that Haji Berry has been out of the squad for each of the last two games, but he has not appeared on the injury report. And then over the weekend, it sort of began to rumble a little bit that he may have secured a transfer to Egypt, which obviously is crazy that the reigning golden boot winner, someone with 16 goals and nine assists for a top USL side, is just going to be gone like that. And it is unclear whether he's just uh, missing at the moment, negotiating that transfer, or if he will leave at the end of the season. But I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what is rapidly becoming a really interesting storyline out of Colorado Springs. Yeah, and that really puts a dent into just kind of a lot of their playoffs uh, kind of going forward. You're looking at a Colorado Springs team who's winless in their last four, and they'll probably still end up with a home playoff game based off the work they've done up to this point in the season. But it's really one that they should be on upset alert if they go into the playoffs on this much of a slide. We know how important it is for the postseason to be that team who's riding the good form going into it. And that could be a switchbacks team that if it's going through that 
how much uh, just kind of tumultuous scenes or stuff behind the scenes, it could really put them on upset alert. No, absolutely. And um, we just talked about El Paso. They would be the likeliest opponent in the first round. This is a locomotive team that went into the playoffs last year as the one seed. They're really talented with what they do in the midfield. That to me seems like a really tough matchup for kind of a spiraling switchbacks team. But in terms of uh, what they might do if Barry is gone in the immediate term, we've seen over these past couple games, they've sort of moved into a 3-4-3 shape. Uh, they've been, they were playing kind of a 4-2-4 with Barry as like the leading light in the forward line. So they moved that player slot back to a center back role and they're leaning into Aaron Wheeler as this really plotting physical hold up player and praying that Michigalina and Elvis Amo can run off of him. And as we've seen, that's two straight losses, but it was two losses before that. So they're really struggling in a lot of ways. I was wondering, do you have any insight into the quality of Egypt? Not to put you on the spot, but I tend to think of maybe like Al Ali, a couple of the clubs as kind of African Titans, but I'm not really sure about kind of the heft and weight of that league in general. It does, uh, like Al Ali is probably the most notable team that is within Egypt, and they do always tend to send teams to uh, Egypt's top Champions League that goes pretty yeah. far. I think we've had a few years where uh, Al Ali actually made it into the Club World Cup as well. So it's a very, I would say, a decently competitive league. Yeah, I'm, I'm the closest sort of parallel I'm thinking of is um, when we had uh, Cohen, the goalkeeper, go over to Israel, for instance, which obviously they compete in UEFA, so it's a bit apples and oranges. Uh, I know we've had a handful of players come over from African leagues to the USL. I believe that maybe Richmond Antwi from Phoenix this season is the case. So it's obviously a fool's errand to try to uh, draw an equivalency, but I am curious maybe like what kind of fee would Haji Berry draw? You've seen some of the younger prospects get into the high six digits. Berry is approaching 30, but he's a prolific striker. So it's just a really interesting and surprising case in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'll be curious if we uh, learn what this would uh, kind of net for uh, Colorado Springs on just kind of any sort of transfer fee that they would possibly gain from this. But this could be a fairly uh, decent uh just a fairly decent fee received from the switchbacks. If it's kind of within that same realm of what we've seen of other teams going, of other leagues coming into USL and uh, buying players like you saw with Junior Flemings and if Jonathan Gomez and a few others that had left for uh, out overseas leagues. And like you had even mentioned Zach Cohen at starting for a team in Israel who played against uh, PSG in the Champions League. So there is at least comparable talent to kind of go into these leagues overseas and compete at a very high level. Yeah, and Fleming's definitely feels like the closest approximation here. Obviously moving to France in his case, but he's a player who was in his mid to upper 20s and he got a couple hundred thousand dollars to make that move. Barry is more prolific than he was, certainly. So just a lot of interest there. Um, if you didn't have any other broad storylines, let's get into the told you so's and the shockers from the past week in the championship in League One, and you can start us off either way there. Yeah, so I had said last show that I was going to lock uh, the Monterey Bay uh, results against uh, Phoenix Rising. We actually had all picked uh, Monterey Bay in that one, and it went down to a missed penalty at the 90th minute that would have broken a deadlock, but it ends 3-3, three to three and a very just uh, high attacking game from Monterey who generated 19 shots off of that. But to not come away with three points certainly has to be kind of disappointing considering that a result would have taken them into a lot better spot of the playoff picture rather than uh, four points or sorry, four games to go and two points out. Yeah, that game really meant a lot in terms of what that draw did for their playoff hopes. So right now, um, they're three points back of El Paso, but even if they get the win, they'll be on even matches and they'll be woefully behind in terms of goal difference. And you're seeing that early season run where they were on the road and getting drubbed every week really come back to bite them in terms of some of the tie break things that you might look at. Um, I know that a couple of Monterey fans that I was talking with 
were quite heated about the referee assignment for that game. I forgive me, can't remember the name of uh, the referee who was assigned to it, but he apparently was a Fresno native. And so there was a little bit of conspiracy theory going on that because this was the team that used to be, or rather own Fresno's franchise rights, uh, that the fact that he gave two penalties in favor of the rising was a bit problematic. I tend not to buy into that, but it is a little bit wild just in terms of sheer coincidence. And you feel unlucky because Monterey totally outplayed Phoenix there, but that's soccer sometimes. Yeah, I mean, and not to say that Monterey didn't have their chance. They had the aforementioned penalty at 90 that could have won them the game, and you would have forgotten all about the two penalties conceded on Phoenix or two penalties conceded against Phoenix. It's just sometimes it just doesn't go your way, and Monterey continues to find themselves on the outside looking in. However, they still are unbeaten uh, in the last five games, a feat in the Western Conference only matched by San Antonio. Yeah, and that's something to write home about, certainly. Um, I'll go ahead and pivot over to my shocker, and that would be Orange County going, I believe, going on the road, maybe hosting, I can't quite remember, but uh, getting a draw again on the road. Okay, yeah, getting the draw at Highmark Stadium against the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. And not only getting that positive result where you're the worst team in the West going to an Eastern contender, but they started a 17-year-old at center back. They brought on uh, Bryce Jameson, another teenager that they signed at midweek. I believe they gave a debut to yet another academy-level player. So to have all that happen, to have the game culminate in a a 90th-minute goal from Milan Alaski, that's really what you want to see if you're Orange County at this point where the season is lost, but you're doing so much with your play of, or player development. And then meanwhile, uh, off with the U.S. U-20 team, Karede Oshindina went and got an assist today, and he's captaining the side. So this is an Orange County team that has a track record of selling off players to Europe. It's a theme of the show today. <laughs> but um, they're just doing really well in terms of turning what could have been a lost season into something that can have positive effects in the longer term for them. Yeah, and it's certainly a, a it's a lost season at this point. Orange County is eliminated, but they're at least they're not guaranteed to finish bottom of the table. You have the Phoenix Rising, who's only one point above them as of right now. And one of the motivators that you have for a lot of these teams is the potential to play spoiler. And for Pittsburgh, on the other hand, to not get a, a three points out of this one, it certainly kind of hurts their chances, considering that you have Tampa Bay and Birmingham both. Uh, at least two points ahead and Tampa Bay with a game in hand that could really help their case on like kind of securing that kind of home playoff game that Pittsburgh might be missing out on. Pittsburgh is such an interesting item in the East right now. You look at what they have in the midfield, some of the quality players they have up top, and you think that they should just be able to pull together results in a much more consistent fashion than they do. And no matter how they've changed up the tactics between a back three and a back four, who's lining up where in the midfield, they never pull it together in a way that is fully convincing for my taste. And so they're going to be in a position more than likely where they're going to have to go on the the road in the first round. It's a little bit disappointing, and it's certainly going to be a challenging task for them. And I think that's really part of what informed this as my pick for the surprise of the week, which... It shouldn't because this has been the story of Pittsburgh this year, I guess. Yeah, and you're looking at a team who's just, they're so iconic for playing well at home, and you have to start out the playoffs on the road. It spells trouble for them. And it's a Riverhounds team who has the lowest goal differential of any playoff team at the moment, and the only side in the playoffs who has just one win in their last five. It's not really the form you would want to kind of inspire the team to go into the playoffs with, and especially if you have a Detroit and Miami team who's unbeaten in their last five, really catching up to you quickly. You could definitely see Pittsburgh kind of tumble down the standings and just stumble their way into sixth or seventh in the playoffs. Yeah, that I mean, the thought of that is really crazy. Um, in terms of, I did just want to throw in, since I was talking youth with Orange County, The fact that FC Tulsa also gave debuts to four different teenage players. Uh, Christopher Pearson, who's an under-20 international for Jamaica, looked really great as a defensive midfielder. Um, Two of the players they gave debuts to were involved in the what was the go-ahead goal at the time and what was ultimately a 2-2 draw against Detroit. 
Uh, I wrote about it this week in Backyield, but I think it's just a really positive development in the USO. So I don't know if it's shocking because we've seen the league trend that way, but just the broader commitment to those sort of youth aspects is something that I've been impressed with for sure. And FC Tulsa with that result uh, goes unbeaten against Detroit this season, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, disappointing. They'll finish outside of the uh, playoff picture here. Uh, it was two losses here in their last five. And it was certainly one team that we were at least really rooting for and hoping that they could get in to the playoffs somehow, but there could still be at least a strong enough finish that they, it would look a lot better if they finished above 40 points and within a touching distance of a possible Miami, Detroit, or Pittsburgh in front of them. But yeah, uh, Detroit City getting their uh, third draw in their last five, and it was certainly a game that uh, we had all picked um, Detroit to actually win this one. I think Gio was the only one who picked Tulsa. And it was one that we just assumed that Detroit's good form was going to continue. And it would kind of really just move them in front of Pittsburgh and potentially give them a chance to climb to maybe even as, as high as third if they continued their form. Yeah, Detroit, um, in the past week, they have had that draw against Tulsa, obviously, but they drew with the Baby Bowls before that, which is a result that nobody ever wants to see. They've really been rotating their squad a lot recently. Uh, you'd seen them bring in a couple of new players within the past couple of weeks, and those talents are really kind of hitting the road at this point. Cy Goddard got into the starting lineup. Richard Foster has been getting a lot of run at fullback. Um, I think it just takes a little bit of time maybe for them to build chemistry and get comfortable for what is a pretty punishing system from Trevor James, where you're expected to get end to end, do a lot of defending. So maybe it pays off come a month from now when they're in the thick of it in the playoffs and these players have that modicum of familiarity with what is expected of them. But to give up that chance to really take a tight grip on a home playoff game at Keyworth, I mean, that seems to me to be invaluable just based on the atmosphere. Yeah, if you're looking at just teams who really benefit from playing at home, Detroit has to be towards the top of the league that just – they need to like be playing towards that home playoff game because that could just really boost their chances. And having to go on the road isn't impossible. It it's certainly something that we've seen Detroit been able to do. They have seven wins away from home this year, but just to play a home playoff game, it would make it a very difficult environment to go in and get a result. We've seen other teams go into Keyworth this year and really struggle to come out with goals and come out with a victory. No, that's absolutely the case. Um, let's pivot over to some of the told you so's that we have from the last week. I guess uh, one told you so that us and Gio had both picked was a Monterey Bay draw with uh, the Miami <laughs> FC. It was the, uh, uh, yeah, it was the second consecutive draw from uh, Monterey Bay and a team that is sort of still on the uh, outside looking in of the playoff picture. But if you're looking at some of the remaining games of Las Vegas, a very tough out against Tampa Bay, then two road matches against Tulsa and RGV, there are still points on the board right now that they could get results to find themselves in the playoff picture, especially come the final Saturday of the season against RGV. Yeah, I mean, you invoke that RGV game. How massive is that with RGV currently in the seventh spot? Uh, Monterey is just such an interesting case where you wonder what happens if they were able to get some home games. You wish maybe that they had found a little bit more comfort in defense early on. That result, uh, that draw against Miami was a really interesting game because Miami came out looking a little bit flat. And much as with Detroit and Pittsburgh, they're a team that you think, hey, if we win a couple of these games in a row at the end of the year, what if we're able to host a playoff game? And even if the atmosphere at FIU isn't exactly lighting the world on fire, it's an important factor for a team to force the other side to travel. So I think there was a lot going on there. And I'm surprised that by the end of it, I think both teams looked a little bit tired, which makes more sense, certainly, if you're Monterey going from California down to South Beach. But I don't know. The game just struck me a little bit odd in a couple of ways. Yeah, it would certainly seem like this result has pretty much played Miami out of a playoff picture. And like you had mentioned, it's not the most electric atmosphere for Miami at that stadium, but it's certainly not the easiest place to travel to being so far south 
and just compare to everyone else who they would potentially have to be playing. Like, could you imagine a Pittsburgh or a Detroit having to travel that far south for a playoff game? It would make it a very difficult task. But yeah, you had mentioned just the difference between Monterey if they had like more home games earlier. I mean, just eight wins this season compared to just four victories away from home. It makes it just kind of one of those what ifs if they could have started the year without that very long road trip and kind of improve their circumstances and not had to play catch up this year. You had mentioned earlier in the show of having that minus seven goal difference was certainly something that's going to kind of hold them back. If we get into any tiebreakers, I am curious though with RGV as they have Louisville and Memphis back to back, which really is a tough task. And if you're looking at a Monterey Bay team who has a weekend game or sorry, a Tuesday game against uh, Las Vegas starting here shortly, it, it's not foreseeable that RGV drop their next two games and make it a very difficult road for them. The issue for RGV is that you maybe hoped that Louisville could have maybe wrapped up a home or the uh, number one seed at this point, and that's not the case. It's a neck and neck race between Louisville and Memphis right now in a game we should discuss uh, with that matchup. But RGV, uh, they got the job done over the weekend, and they have nothing but a tall task ahead of them. And they're in sizzling form right now. I think it might be four wins out of five. Uh, Christian Pinzon is looking amazing on the left wing, just scoring bangers for fun at this point. Emilio Yacaza, brilliant in the midfield. But, I mean, (laughs) that's just how it breaks down sometimes, where you get really unlucky with the interconference games, but couldn't be a tougher task for them. Yeah, and it was July 27th for RGV when the find the last time they were shut out and it was against Hartford. So they've been doing well with finding the back of the net in these recent games, including two consecutive shutouts. But yeah, it's a really tough draw and to have to play Louisville. Well, at home at least benefits it because we've always said that going down to RGV is like going to a rainy night in Stoke. It's a very difficult <laughs> road game for any team. And it's a Louisville team which... We had uh, touched on this a little bit as a two to one loss against uh, Memphis with the three red cards right at the end of the game there. And a team who hasn't wrapped up the number one seed and will be looking to try and have a bounce back game. I think the interesting thing right now in terms of Louisville is that they have two wins in or, yeah, two wins in seven games right now. They, despite the talent, despite a lot of draws in that stretch, just aren't playing the best soccer. So maybe RGV can pull it off, but you never can count out Louisville City. And they're a team that has been rotating their squad endlessly because of the comfort of, hey, even if we don't get the number one seed, we're still going to get a home playoff game. But just pivoting to the other side of that matchup real quick, I think it was quite the game from Memphis where time and again, they were able to find Jeremy Kelly on the break. Uh, they made the really smart decision to drop Laurent Cassiadu into the midfield, or the pivot rather, very deep in the midfield, where he was a safe pair of hands. He's one of their most technical players, and he really gave them a sense of comfort against that strong Louisville press. Memphis just knows which strings to pull to get the result they need. Uh, they had their two points back of Louisville, but with a game in hand down the stretch. And I honestly wouldn't bet against them to maybe go and grab that number one seed in the East. Yeah, I mean, they have three wins uh, in a row right now. And we've seen how well with Memphis playing at home with 10 wins already on the season. And we've already mentioned RGV, but they have uh, a road match against the Miami this weekend. And then the Baby Bulls for their final home game, NFC Tulsa. And if everything breaks right, that's potential. That's very much 12 points on the table for them that they could easily pick up all games. Yeah, definitely. I tend to agree with that for sure. Um, I did want to pivot to a little bit of League One talk just before we move on to some picks here. Uh, something fun is that the last six games in USL League One have all had at least one red card, which is completely random and hilarious. But uh To get my told you so in there, I had Tormenta beating Madison as one of my picks last week, and I specifically shouted out the play of Joshua Phelps in the back line. Not only did Phelps lead the side to a clean sheet, but he got the goal in a 1-0 win. So League One tends to be fairly havoc-filled. There are still no teams that are mathematically eliminated from playoff contention, despite the fact that we're really getting down to the stretch. 
But uh, I mean, a really big result for Tormenta, a bad loss for forward Madison yet again. Just wondering if you have thoughts in that game or anything that caught your eye League One wise. And we had talked about a little bit last show of just kind of Central Valley's kind of just more kind of inner turmoil of their head coach and just how their fans are at least perceiving how the team is going. But they picked up a 1-1 draw with Richmond over the past weekend, and that was on the back of a 3-0 result over Ford Madison, a TCA Fuego team, who's now still only three points out of a playoff spot with a match in hand over the Chattanooga Red Wolves. And it's something that it could certainly help kind of turn around their season. And it may have been a bit too quick to judge. I mean, their home form isn't fantastic. It was just four wins at home this season. But you have North Carolina, Northern Colorado, SC Tucson, and then Omaha on the final day. If you're looking at three of those teams, uh, Northern Colorado notwithstanding, uh, those, two of those sides are below them in the table. And they could very well pick up results against – Northern Colorado to really kind of boost themselves into the playoffs. And at that point of the season, there's a real chance that other results pending Omaha might've picked up uh, one of the top three seeds and solidified a home playoff game. So how motivated would they be in that scenario? Much less the fact that I think that their 442 is a little bit susceptible to what central Valley does. So I think that, yeah, is a really interesting story to watch and it sort of bolsters kind of what everyone was saying when we talked about the Fuego and maybe a little bit of the overreaction to a blip in their form. Yeah, and, and especially if you look at some of the teams that are currently in playoff spots, and there are three sides that just jump out to me that just don't have the strongest form. Uh, like Chattanooga has just one win in their last five, same with Omaha with just one in their last five and none in their last four. And then you still have the Greenville Triumph team with no wins in their last five and a goal difference who has just completely tumbled down from where they once were. In fact, you have Triumph on one, Tormenta on zero, and the Independence has a negative one goal differential. It's really only Richmond and Chattanooga who have the current double digit uh, goal differentials at the moment. Yeah, I was flagging that about Chattanooga, who's plus 12 on the season, yet uh, sitting deep, pretty deep in sixth place. Granted, I mean, within shouting distance of second because League One is so tight. But it really is interesting how that sort of bored itself out over the course of the season so far. And you wouldn't expect them to have the second best uh, goal differential this year if you kind of add in a few of their like really lopsided uh, results that they've potentially have that some of the that they've had this year i mean it was a 7-1 win they had a 5-1 win over uh greenville triumph so there are certainly these very wide margin uh results that they would have no absolutely uh any other league one championship notes if not we'll move on to the picks good to go okay so a busy week in the usl as ever but we're going to start off with that West Coast matchup taking uh, Sacramento Republic, who are going to be hosting Phoenix Rising to start this off. I have actually locked Sacramento Republic for this game this week. I think Phoenix has been in very poor form. You have three losses out of their last five and no wins in their last four. Sacramento is really going to want, to, I think, would really want to push to get that kind of third place seed. I do think the top four in the West right now is pretty much set, and those are going to be your four teams there but if they have these matches in hand and they could jump over the switchbacks and get that number three seed i think it would very much benefit them so i have republic winning this one in a lock yeah i completely agree with you on that sacramento is a team that no matter who they're up against is going to be playing a really good defensive game and they're also a team that can take advantage of poor defensive sides you saw that four goal outburst against orange county a week or so back Phoenix very much qualifies as a poor defensive side, and I really see the Republic going out and needing the three points with that motivation to bring a home game to Northern California there. Uh, moving on in a game that we had mentioned already, RGV are hosting Louisville City. Yeah, it's interesting. I, we have mentioned that RGV is very motivated for trying to find and hold on to this playoff spot and that they just have such a difficult away task at hand. And you're looking at a Louisville team who you have to go all the way back to August 20th to find their last victory away from home. That's four consecutive results away from home where they just didn't find a um, just they didn't get a win. And there were two consecutive draws in that time against Tulsa and Pittsburgh away. 
I think it's going to be a very tough task for them, and RGV is going to play up for it. So I think the points will be shared, but it's not going to be an easy game for Louisville. Yeah, we're simpatico once again because I went draw as well. I tend to think that this is something of a poor matchup for an RGV team that isn't the most technical in terms of the players they have at the back, and they're not going to respond well to what Louisville does at the press. Louisville is also very adept with those skilled center backs who are going to be a little bit press proof against RGV's system. That said, this team just has shown a lot of heart. Uh, they were a side last year that really came on strong, made the playoffs because of their late season transfer additions. I kind of see that playing out again. And I think that a draw against Louisville is a very respectable or respectable result to get them continuing on that path. So draw there. In a game that I am not sure why Kaler threw onto the slate, we also have Hartford against Charleston. He loves these uh, stoppable yeah. force versus <laughs> movable object games. And yeah, it, I guess as a player, you're obviously wanting to play to the best of your abilities each time. You're trying to play for a job for next season to either stay on your current team or to try and have an audition for a better a better team. But like as a coach, I think it's, these games are always like really fascinating to try and motivate your team to kind of go out and play for. A lot of it is basically playing for just the pride of your team, the pride of your finish, and wanting to have the best possible finish to the season. I think it's a really interesting matchup and it's one that like Hartford at home recently has been pretty okay. The last two games at home, they've had a combined six goals and both wins. I don't know. Charleston just hasn't been the most inspiring team as of late, nor have they been on the road, which is one win. I'm going to lean with a draw with this one, but it really wouldn't surprise me if the battery lose this. It's a bit of a weird one for sure, just because you're not really positive where either your team is at mentality wise. I did go with a Hartford win. I have loved what they've been doing in attack where uh, Tab Ramos has basically moved them into what offensively looks like a 3-2-5. They're very aggressive with their positioning in the midfield and in the wide areas. Charleston has shown a penchant for kind of giving up the hunt a little bit if they give up that first goal. So it made me think that Hartford, with a lot of players who want to prove that they're someone Tab Ramos wants to bring back next year, might have just a little bit more motivation behind them in this game. But as with you, this could go either way. Uh, speaking of another game between Eastern eliminated sides, we've got Indy 11 hosting FC Tulsa at Carroll Stadium. And with Carroll Stadium hosting this game, Indy 11 has won four consecutive games at home right now, and three of them against uh, playoff teams, including San Antonio and Louisville among those, which is just like really improved form from Indy 11 over these past couple games. Uh, they have the midweek game against uh, Atlanta United 2 tomorrow night, but going up against FC Tulsa, I think they're really going to be motivated to kind of finish out this home run of form and really improve upon their standing and kind of be that best of the rest team at the moment. So I'm taking the 11 to win. Yeah, um, I invoked it a little bit earlier in the show where Tulsa is committed to just giving the kids some minutes and they showed some potential in that vein, but Indy has kind of come out with a chip in, on their shoulder recently. Mark Lowry has shown a real penchant for making the right substitutions, changing up his system to fit the opposition. It's sort of a similar situation to what I was mentioning in Hartford, where there feels like a real impetus to try to prove that you should be back in an 11 uniform next year. So I think with that hot home form, with a little bit more of a veteran squad, they get the full three points against Tulsa and uh, jump over Tulsa in the table, in fact. Yeah, uh, and yeah, like oh, out ahead. of these... Uh, it's interesting you kind of compare both Hartford and Indy 11 right now. They're two teams who have had like somewhat identical seasons, just kind of how they've been in the table right now. And both teams are looking to kind of have a bounce back year next season. And like of these trio of Tulsa, Indy, and Hartford, which one would you say would be finishing the highest in the table next season, wherever that might be in the table? I, I had Indy pegged as the last team into the playoffs this year. I tend to be someone who is high on what Mark Lowry is doing. Tulsa would be maybe the close team here, but I really think we're due for Indy to kind of get back into the upper echelons of the East, possibly. How are you feeling on this, though? 
Yeah, I would I would lean a lot towards kind of Tulsa and Indy. It would be I'm real still hesitant on how Hartford is, but I don't know. This end of the season for Indy in particular has kind of given me vibes of how Sacramento kind of ended last season, a rather disappointing uh, 13th best team in the Western Conference, but they're bounced back this season into a top four spot of the West. It's something I think Indy is certainly capable of doing over this course of the next season. And we've seen with what Lowry has done that he's able to turn around teams. And I think after a season under his belt in Indianapolis and to have an offseason, he can certainly improve the setting, kind of more molded in his image. No, I'm completely with you. And I think that's a natural transition to the Memphis game. It's another team that has had a coach really mold the team in his image. But Memphis is traveling down to the Miami FC. So how are you feeling about that? Memphis is coming off the back of the aforementioned uh, three wins off the bounce. But you have a Miami team who is unbeaten in their last five as well. I do think Memphis ends up getting the result here as they have – really a motivation to want to lock down this number one seed and kind of get that advantage of having the buy in the playoffs. And especially if Louisville is going to leave the door open for them, there is a chance that they really play up for these final couple games and get that kind of last push for the postseason. Yeah. I'm going with Memphis as well. They've really got that big motivation to make a statement and beat Louisville for that one seed. I think that they play at a tempo that is really going to catch Miami out. Miami, a team that pushes Mark Segler so high up the right side, a little bit variable and fluid in what they do defensively, trying to maintain the solidity of their system against a really technically brilliant Memphis is going to be a tall task. And that makes me think that Ben Pierman's team is going to go on the road and get that big result. But again, this is one where I just have a little bit of caveat, but I don't know. I trust Memphis at this point in the year. Uh, moving on from that one, we've got a really fun intra-conference matchup taking uh, Pittsburgh, who's hosting San Antonio FC. Yeah, it's interesting having these very late uh, intra-conference matchups. You have San Antonio doing a uh, East Coast swing going up against Pittsburgh and Birmingham in these uh, next two consecutive games. But uh, I believe with this one that uh, it's interesting looking at Pittsburgh out of their home victories this year, only three of the teams they've beat at Highmark this season occupy a current playoff spot. And you have to go all the way back to July 30th to find the last time they even beat a team at home. I think given that benefit and the fact that San Antonio is just so close to wrapping up the shield here that San Antonio is going to get the win. Yeah, um, Pittsburgh is a team that just hasn't shown the ability to break down a set opponent, even though they've got Canardo Forbes and Robbie Mertz and Dane Kelly and all those talents. And there is no team in the USL that is as good at sitting back in block and beating teams on the strength of their defense than San Antonio. And to be able to go and really romp away with the shield I think is something that is going to drive this team to want to do as well as they can down the stretch to carry on the momentum. They've had a lot of injuries, San Antonio has, and so bringing those players back into the fold is something that's going to be important as well. So I think all of those factors coalesce and get San Antonio a win here. How would you uh, talk about? Oh, go ahead. For San Antonio, it's interesting having like clinched the shield for uh, uh, so close to the end of the season, but still have some games left. How would you, like, as a San Antonio, if you were the San Antonio manager at this point, how would you still kind of motivate your team to not want to drop in form, especially going into the postseason and having that first round bye? Hey, we've seen it hasn't always been some of the benefits. I think the last time USL had a first round bye was in 2015, and the number one seed in the Western Conference that year did end up losing in that first game that they had. So it's certainly not a guarantee of a result to have that first round bye. I think you just hammer home the fact that what you're doing in the regular season is great, but you have to stay sharp and never rest on your laurels. Uh, I believe I was checking it out today. I think of the last 10 conference champions or rather teams that have had the best record in their conference, only two of them have even made the USL cup final or something really spectacularly strange like that. So you look at the history, you say, listen, guys, what we've done is great, but you have to stay as sharp as possible would be the motivation. And this is a team and a clubhouse that has a lot of leaders in it, a lot of experienced players. 
So I trust that they can stay in the mix there. Yeah, and we've seen just notoriously that the Western Conference has been a very difficult conference to get through since they did the two split into the into the two conferences. I mean, you had Swope Park uh, two consecutive seasons. You had Orange County out, out of last season. So it's very a, a t- difficult road for those top seeds, and it's really anyone can go out in any round. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of the fun and the beauty of the playoff format. Um, A team that we're not sure is going to get there, and we've talked about a lot, is Monterey Bay. And they will be hosting the Tampa Bay Rowdies at weekend. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to see how Tampa Bay really approaches this game. Obviously, they were gearing up uh, at least to have a match against El Paso until very recently that it was moved. But yeah, to kind of shift focus so quickly to travel across the country for uh, Monterey, who will be playing in their final home game on this Saturday, at least of the regular season. And it's interesting to see how they really want to approach this game. And for both sides, I just feel like that kind of brings an atmosphere that is going to be conducive of getting a draw. So that I'm going to be predicting that. Yeah, uh, Tampa Bay, without a win in their last three, they've not really beaten anyone that good since about August 6th when they got a win over Detroit. I think they're at the point in the season where Neil Collins is really going to hammer home the importance of finding form, getting some consistent offense. And I think more so than a lot of teams, Tampa Bay comes in with a level of experience that's going to do them a lot of good. Meanwhile, while they are at home, Monterey Bay has got a really congested schedule at the moment. So I think these factors just combine to get Tampa Bay a narrow win, but a win nonetheless, and I'm blocking that one, in fact. Um, Moving on from the championship down to League One, though, we start off with a Chattanooga matchup against the Charlotte Independents. I think this would be a matchup that a lot of teams in League One will be really wanting to watch beyond uh, Charlotte and Chattanooga, just given that they are basically the gatekeepers of the playoffs at the moment. The result of this game could determine how wide open the picture is for those on the outside looking in and how safe the picture is for those currently above the playoff line. You have a Charlotte Independence team who's won uh, three games in a row. And honestly, I'm going to back the Charlotte Independence to win this game and really make it a very sizable gap to getting into these top four or top five seeds and kind of make it Chattanooga on an island with a lot of teams looking at them ready to take their spot. Yeah, I went Charlotte here. I liked a lot of what they were doing in their last game, which the caveat being it came against a pretty lowly North Carolina side. And uh, Gabrielle Overton did get a red card there, which is obviously going to be a big miss. But they feel like they're just figuring out a bit in terms of their attack. Omar Sis, who was a player who really showed a lot of box-to-box potential with Austin last year in the championship, got a lovely goal. I think they're just getting over the line a little bit, and I think they're going to continue to come on strong down the stretch, and that gets them a win here. Uh, We stay Southeastern in the next matchup as well, with South Georgia Tormenta taking on the leading Richmond Kickers. I really think this game is going to have a lot of goals behind them. If you're looking in the last two meetings between these teams, each of them had uh, four goals combined in the result. And we've seen with both of these sides, it was a tormented team who had struggled at home for a lot of the season, but a Richmond team who really had to find their form away from home. I think this is going to be a very high scoring draw. Yeah, I see that. I I just feel like I'm believing in what Tormenta is doing defensively. I know I talked about Phelps already, and Richmond obviously has one of the most potent offensive threats, really some brilliant creation in that midfield. Tormenta is another side where I think that they're starting to find form. They're really getting comfortable in their attacking patterns because I have Sterling looking strong. I'm having them as the home side just get a win here, but it wouldn't surprise me at all to see Richmond kind of get back into it, but I don't know, something screamed Tormenta for me. (laughs) And then to wrap things up in League One and the picks overall, we've got a bit of a Western matchup with Central Valley hosting Northern Colorado. 
What's interesting to me with Northern Colorado right now is they have just three wins on the season away from home. They uh, Their most recent one came on August 27th against Greenville Triumph. But if you take away that result, you have to go all the way back to May 18th, a 2-1 to win over Charlotte to find their last victory away from home. I think that form is something that's really important for that. And we talk about how important playing at home is for League One and for a Fuego team that could be in a playoff spot if they can get um, a result here and be level on points with Chattanooga going out of the weekend. I think that will motivate Central Valley to get a win here. Central Valley for me as well. Northern Colorado coming off that somewhat surprising draw with Greenville where uh, you invoked that earlier win in the season. Very weird that the hailstorm seemed to have the triumphs number to a certain degree. But uh, Irvin Parra got off a goal for them over the weekend, and I like what they're doing. But, I mean, Fuego hosting, they're playing well. Vilion Biev is someone I talk about a lot, but he's an impact player. They feel like they've got a little bit more momentum. I liked a lot of what they did in that 3 to nothing forward win. I went with Fuego in this game. And that wraps up the pick segment for now. So that's all we've got content wise, but Ryan, I'd love if you'd shout out whatever is crossing your mind, soccer, non-soccer, catching your attention. I was a big fan of the first three episodes of Andor. I think it's a huge breath of fresh air into the Star Wars franchise, and I'm excited to see where it goes from here. I think it really benefited the show dropping the first three episodes when they did. Just kind of a kind of it bookends a first act, which I thought was very good, and it's just cool to see another side of the galaxy for Star Wars. So excited for episode four tomorrow. Yeah, I just I won't go too along with that because we are a soccer show. But the three, what you said about dropping the three episodes, which were so intentionally designed to connect in an almost movie like format, was really great. And the content was so refreshing for Star Wars. And I know I talked about Andor last week, but I mean, it lived up to my expectations for sure. And sticking with the Disney properties, um, I did just want to shout out the crazy news. I know we had uh, DM'd a little bit about it that Deadpool 3 is going to be co-starring Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, which who would have thought that five years ago? But I mean, the Deadpool movies, even if you aren't the biggest fan of the kind of quippy fourth wall raking humor, are an event. And to bring in Hugh Jackman is wild. So that's catching my eye. So sorry, no classical music for you Kaler heads out there, but that's <laughs> what I've got. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's what we've got for the week. Thank you to everyone who tuned in live. Uh, thank you to everyone, especially who's listening to this in podcast form. We appreciate all of it. And with that, I will send you out with Alan's beautiful voice. Thank you for watching another episode of the USL show. This and every episode is brought to you by the Beautiful Game Network. Find podcasts and other written work at bgn.fm. Once again, thanks for stopping by, and we'll see you guys again next week. <laughs>